I'm Dave Breckenridge, and this is Under the Dome. In a surprising turn of events, Alberta Premier Jason Kenney announced he's stepping down as leader of the United Conservative Party after party members gave him a bare majority of support in a leadership review vote. That paves the way for a leadership contest, which will feature at least a couple of familiar faces in Alberta politics. This all comes after months of campaigning by people within his own party and without that it's time for him to step aside due to his handling of the COVID pandemic and what some saw as too strict of restrictions to deal with the virus. All that today and more on Under the Dome. I'm sorry, but friends, I truly believe that we need to move forward united. We need to put the past behind us. And our members, a large number of our members have asked for an opportunity to clear the air through a leadership election. My guests today are Edmonton Journal legislature reporters. We have Ashley Joano and Lisa Johnson. Thanks very much, both of you, for joining me after what was, I'm sure, a very hectic evening, Wednesday evening. Just to give viewers a bit of perspective, we had waited weeks for the results of this leadership review. It was originally intended to be in person in Red Deer. It was changed to a mail-in vote. And then we waited for the mail-in ballots to come in, get validated, and then counted. And even on counting day, we were left waiting a little longer than we were told we were going to have to. And for people in the news business, you know that uh, evening stories are always a little tricky. But at the end of it all, returning officer Rick Orman, former PC cabinet minister, former leadership hopeful in the PC party, steps forward onto the live stream and announces the results of the simple basic question, do you support our leader? And in the end, Jason Kenney had the support of just 51.4% of party members. Ashley, we'll go to you first. Normally, you know, we don't always ask you for your opinion or your reaction to things, but after weeks and weeks of hearing the Premier talk about feeling very confident in the leadership review, um, feeling that he was going to do very well, what was your reaction when that number was read out and you saw that the premier had just a bare majority of support? Is is gobsmacked an appropriate word to use? I feel like Always. a lot of people, uh, myself included, were uh, gobsmacked. Uh, the When you spoke to people um, who pay attention to politics, people in the government, I think the general expectation was that he would get somewhere in the high 50s to low 60s, and then that would leave a a muddy middle water of like, is that enough support for him to uh, claim that he has the claim that he can govern the party? Um, so for him to end up with 51.4 um, was definitely not what I was expecting. Mm -hmm. And and Lisa, when when Jason Kenney stepped up to the podium to talk to supporters who were in the room. There were a lot of, there was jubilation. There were cheers. And even when he talked about respecting the will of the members, there were a lot of cheers. And I got the sense that he potentially was going to announce that, you know, he was going to stay on. He had talked and in the I lead up to this that a bare majority is considered a win, like 50% plus one. Friends. And I get the sense even the well, crowd felt that well, because when he announced that he was stepping down, as leader of the UCP, there was the crowd seemed generally shocked and saddened. And that is why tonight I have informed the president of the party of my intention to step down as leader of the United Conservative Party. What what was the nature of of his speech Wednesday evening? What what was your takeaway in terms of what he said about the process, what he said about what the party needs to do going forward? It was a rather short speech, and up until the sentence when he actually said, uh, I'm going to resign, uh, I was expecting, uh, I think, what a lot of people in that room were expecting as well, that he would stay on as leader, um, that he would continue to try to bolster his party and and unite it, um, which have been his, you know, focal points for the past couple of months, the importance of uniting the party and having a strong, um, unified voice for conservatives in the province heading into the next election. So I, I think I was as gobsmacked as everybody else. I think maybe we owe Rick Bell royalty for using that word. Um, but 
his speech altogether was quite short and he, he did, um, he did skip over some of his, you know, greatest hits, some of his accomplishments that he, that he's proud of achieving in his term. Um, but it was very short and it was, I would say truncated. Um, and, and again, focused still on, on the importance of unity and calling for party members to come together, which is, is been what he's been, uh, gearing towards throughout this whole leadership review campaign. Right. Mm -hmm. Ashley, you've been spending some time in the lead up to this, kind of looking back, uh, getting a sense of, of how we got here. You know, at the, at the risk of repeating myself, how did we get here? How did we get to the point where, where a, a premier who came in like a whirlwind, united two feuding parties five years ago, won the government with a huge majority, um, and seemed to be, you know, in, in the estimation of a lot of people, a skilled organizer, a skilled campaigner, um, a kind of a rock star in conservative politics. How do we get from that to a 51.4% vote of support among members? I think you're, the answer to that question will depend on who you ask. I think a lot of people will have different uh, perspectives on how we landed here. And I think that's something that people are going to be talking about for the days and weeks to come. But there are a couple of key things, I think. Um, 2020 was a rough year globally because of the pandemic. It was also a rough year for Alberta. Uh, I'm sure everyone remembers that at one point, oil prices were in the negative, which is not something we've experienced. Um, and so that was a lot to manage. I think when Kenny started, he sold himself as this grassroots leader, someone who was going to listen to the grassroots of the party. And then when these major world events started happening, uh, he very quickly got accused of sort of forgetting the grassroots and, and, and becoming more um, controlling in his management style. Um, that's what you'll hear from a lot of his critics. And then there is, of course, the, the COVID component. There is a segment of the party who believes that he went too far with the COVID restrictions and that he did not handle that situation the way they wanted him to. Mm -hmm. like when you and, think about... Lisa, from your perspective, you've been covering, the, you've been at the legislature since since 2019, not long after the, the UCP was elected. How do you feel like the last couple of years have gone for Kenny leading into this leadership review? Yeah, I mean, and just to, to spin off what Ashley was saying, if you look back three years, if you look back two years to when uh, Kenny struck his fair deal panel, um, they had a series of recommendations to try to bring more autonomy to Alberta and to fight back against, against Ottawa. And at the time it was, uh, you know, a lot of people considered this a brilliant strategy. It's an escape valve, uh, for a lot of people in Alberta who have grievances with Ottawa, who want to see a provincial police force, for example, want to see a provincial pension plan, um, whether or not those policies are followed through on. At the very least, it gave people an opportunity to discuss them, weigh the pros and cons. There was a report um, afterwards. And, and a key member of that, Drew Barnes, who was formerly a member of the UCP, um, also was very passionate about these issues of Western independence. And so the escape valve, um, I think we saw over the past couple of years, and certainly through COVID, turned into uh, a bit of a screaming kettle. And, and at some point became a little bit out of control for Kenny. Um, obviously, as the pandemic um, debate raged on, a lot of his members became critical of his pandemic approach. Uh, we saw Todd Lowen and Drew Barnes uh, booted from the UCP caucus to become independents. And we saw also, like we saw plenty of UCP backbenchers stepping up to say, I don't agree with the direction this government is going in terms of public health restrictions. Um, so that is certainly a, a big factor when you factor in a lot of the, the complaints that constituency associations had um, and, and a, a lot of, I think, a lot of these UCP MLA's constituents 
had that they were bringing forward to the party and they felt like they weren't being listened to, I think it just compounded and snowballed. And at a certain point, um, those feelings uh, become impossible to fix with facts or with, and, and not to suggest that they're um, not working with the facts, but they, they become impossible to fix. Mm -hmm. Now that kind of brings, brings me to my next question. We, Premier Kenny announced Wednesday evening, he was resigning or he's going to be submitting his resignation as, as leader of the UCP. Um, but there wasn't an indication of, of when he may be resigning as premier. I mean, right now, as it would, would, as logic would dictate, he would step down, the party would elect or select from caucus an interim leader, and then they'd go into a leadership race. We didn't necessarily get a clear answer Wednesday evening about whether that would be the step that is taken or if Kenny would stay on until a leadership race is complete. And I know as we're recording this, caucus is meeting in Calgary uh, today being Thursday. Um, and so there could be developments that happen. But do we get a sense, Ashley or Lisa, um, when the premier could say, OK, I'm going to step away now as leader of the province? That's the big question that I have and that I think a lot of people have. If you listen to what he said during his very short uh, speech where he announced he was going to resign, he never actually said that the party wanted a new leader. What he said was that the party wanted a leadership race. And mm -hmm. reading between the lines, I think it's entirely possible that Jason Kenney will run in the leadership race. Um, whenever that happens. And that creates a whole host of other questions in terms of maybe he won't give up the premiership or maybe he will try to hang on as premier until that leadership race is over. I think that um, the meeting that's happening, the caucus meeting that's happening in Calgary right now um, will hopefully answer a lot of those questions. I think the premier was supposed to have a press conference today uh, we were told that he would be available to the media today. I don't know if that's still going to happen. We haven't heard. But there are certainly um, a whole pile of questions that he needs to answer. Mm -hmm. and, and Lisa, looking at the landscape for Alberta politics right now, we are roughly one year away from the next election, the next fixed election date, although I know it's it's fixed in name only in a lot of ways. But supposed to be May 23rd of next year. We're recording this on May 19th. So just a little over one year until the next election. What's next in the process for the UCP? How quickly does the party have to call a leadership race? And, and when could we see that take place? I mean, if you thought Alberta politics were dramatic and unstable before, I think it's going to get even more unpredictable over the next 12 months. Um, and one thing that I've been thinking about and, and recalling was was back in early April, you'll remember uh, during the, the leadership review campaign, a group of 19 former conservative MLAs came out with a letter endorsing Kenny. And they really laid out a lot of potentialities uh, over the next 12 months. And their argument being, we need to support, we need to get behind our leader if we're going to to come into this election with um, the strength that we need to defeat Rachel Notley. A few things that they outlined um, were that, you know, a leadership race can take months. It could drag out through the summer. Ideally, ideally they'd want to do it in the fall, but that coincides with the federal conservative leadership vote on September 10th. So there's a conflict there where there might be volunteers, a lot of resources going into the federal leadership campaigns. Um, if you push it into October, you're looking at installing a new leader um, within just a few months of a potential election uh, and, and only giving that new leader uh, a little bit of time to, to fully staff um, all of their offices, uh, to lay out a direction, lay out a mandate for, uh, for the newly led party and put together a, a budget and a throne speech in time for February, which would be right before the election. So it's a really tight timeline um, and they do not have a lot of runway, uh, especially when you consider right now where the, how, how much of a head start I think the NDP has, has squeaked out in terms of election readiness at this point in time. Now, 
we're still at the day after the night before. There's still a lot of time for this to take shape, but already there's starting to be some speculation about who may be in the race to replace Jason Kenney. Um, I know former Wild Rose leader Brian Jean uh, already has kind of put his hand up. Uh, Daniel Smith, former Wild Rose leader and former radio host, has, has, is holding a press conference uh, Thursday morning to announce what I assume will be her intentions. Ashley, are any other names at this point contenders or people that that could put their hands up? Are there any cabinet ministers who may have designs on this or are there concerns that that they could be seen as too too much a part of the Jason Kenney era? I mean, like you said, we're so soon after the announcement that there's all sorts of names that are floating around, whether it's someone like uh, Doug Schweitzer who ran for the UCP leadership originally, or someone like a like a Nate Glubish or a Layla here who has uh, been a critic of Kenny, um, I or a Travis Taves. Um, I do just want to say that I think if Kenny says that he plans to run in the leadership race, I think that that could change um, who among the sitting. Uh, ministers would also consider running. Like I think mm-hmm. he does have a a close circle of advisors, and I'm not sure if they would want to run against him if he expressed interest in the leadership. Yeah. Now, what's been the reaction like to to this? I know the both of you were gobsmacked, as you as you said. We'll we'll send another dollar to Rick Bell at the Calgary Sun for using his favorite word. Um, Lisa, you were getting some reaction on Wednesday evening. What what was the feeling related to the the numbers for Jason Kenny and his announcement that he was stepping aside as leader? I mean, what I was hearing was was shock and surprise. I think a lot of people expected him to squeak out a narrow victory or, or something between 50 and 60%, but, but to, to continue to hold the reins and, and want to be uh, the leader of this party. So I think there was a lot of, I think there was a, a lot of surprise across the board. You know, for, for me, I was sitting in, in my workspace at home. We're all working from home still for the most part. Um, I know that the both of you are at the legislature, but my internet cut out as soon as Rick Orman started talking, started like right at that moment. And so I'm scrambling and I'm looking at my, I have trying to get to my phone and look at my phone and pull up Twitter. And I was just, I did not expect it as, as many other people did not expect the result to be where it was. I think a lot of us, maybe, maybe a lot of people out there were believing the accusations that were being put out there about some funny business with ballots and assumed that the number would be much higher. And then some of us believe that, you know, Kenny's never won to be counted out and he's kind of, he's been able to um, it, pull victory from j- the jaws of defeat and, and has been able to, to manage through a, a pandemic and, and some economic issues. And, and to be honest, I thought that because we were at a point where the economy was rebounding, the price of oil was getting better, the budget was balanced, that party leaders may have put that behind them. What was the the sense from the NDP? I know that that the opposition has has taken a lot of glee. I get the sense in in really laying the hammer to to the UCP over the last few months. It seems that our inboxes every day are full of of press releases. That even when there's a decision that they agree with, the the NDP is very much trying to take the UCP down a peg, that the decision didn't go far enough or it's too late or anything like that. What was the reaction from the opposition to the word that that Kenny announced that he was stepping back as leader for a new leadership race? The NDP will be holding a press conference this afternoon. And I think it's very uh, telling that the description of the press conference that we've gotten so far is that it's about uh, showing how united the NDP is and how ready they are to govern. So I get the sense that that is the the step they're taking right now is to try and paint themselves in contrast to the fractured UCP party, that they are a united group ready to govern. Um, I do think that they will have to wait and see who ends up leading the party because it will 
Um, if it is if it is an outsider who comes in, someone like a Brian Jean or a Daniel Smith or even um, a Rona a Rona Ambrose, who I know the the political scientist that Lisa spoke with had mentioned, um, I think that that changes the NDP's game a little bit um, when compared to if it is someone who's already a sitting cabinet minister or if it's Jason Kenney again. Um, so I think they have to wait. But right now, their focus seems to be on projecting that they are a united front while the UCP is not. Mm -hmm. Well, I know there's a lot of moving parts to this and the story is, is still developing even as we're speaking. Uh, we'll let you get back to your days. Lisa Johnson, Ashley Joano, thanks for joining me. Thanks very much. Thanks, Dave. That's it for this episode of Under the Dome. Don't forget you can find all past episodes at edmontonjournal.com slash under the dome and you can hit that subscribe button on YouTube. I'm Dave Breckenridge. We'll see you next time. 